And we have a, a great talk tonight. Um, but first, before we get to that, I just want to make sure you're all safe and well. Um, and I hope you all had the chance to vote. So I'm going to introduce our speaker. Andrea Steele is the founding principal of Andrea Steele Architecture, or ASA, a New York-based practice that believes the scale of architecture is not measured by its physical size, but by its positive impact on people, resources, and sense of place. With over two decades of experience practicing architecture, Andrea Steele has led a wide range of complex urban design projects throughout the United States. Steele served as partner and principal of 10 Arquitectos New York's office for more than eight years before renaming the studio in 2019. As Andrea Steele Architecture, the studio continues the design rigor and excellence with a heightened focus on institutional, cultural, and community-oriented projects. Andrea has a master's Master of Architecture degree from the GSD, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. She has taught at numerous schools, including Cornell University. And I wanna read one sentence from her website. Andrea Steele Architecture is dedicated to accessing the humanity inherent in the design process. I just love that statement. And I think um, it's, uh, we're gonna learn more about that. So Andrea, it's all yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Carol. And thank you to the SBA community for inviting me. Uh, let me just close this. Okay. Everyone see my screen all good? Okay. Sorry. Let me just, okay. It's, uh, it's always wonderful to be given a chance to share our work and our ideas with others. Um, tonight, especially so. Uh, as everyone is probably painfully aware, <laughs> the U.S. is in the process of selecting our next president. Um, it would be an understatement to say 2020 has presented all of us with incredible challenges. The cause of these challenges often seem to be out of our control, uh, which is why it's so important to remind ourselves what is within our control. Voting is an incredible right many of us have to express our voice, but tonight's talk uh, you know, I'll focus on how we can express that voice through design. Regardless of the outcome of this election, as designers, we are always expressing our voices through the built form, and we can and will continue to express our voice to make positive change towards, you know, hopefully what is a better and more equitable shared future. So regardless of what happens tonight or when the outcome is, we can make change and continue to make change. My studio believes that our primary responsibility as architects is connecting. Connecting people to people, people to resources, and people to a sense of place. And how we connect them is really where design exists. Here's a picture of my incredible studio. There are a diverse group of talents, ideas, and insights. Um, this is kind of what I see now through Zoom video. Um, we created this for the website, but again, now it's our our shared space for the moment. As well, our projects are incredibly diverse. You know, at this moment, many of the spaces are currently vacant or partially occupied, some acting as places of refuge for those in quarantine, while others are acting in new capacities to respond to the moment. But all are direct responses to the needs of their communities. Every one of them provides much needed resources. You know, resources is really what I want to focus on. Many people go without resources, not because they do not exist, um, but because they are not known, they're not visible, or they're not accessible to them. Architecture is not just about providing a space for resources. It's not just creating the, the, the um, enclosure to put the programming in. But architecture is about ensuring that through thoughtful integration and organization, we remove the many boundaries that often prevent the equitable access, distribution, and use of those resources. So this lecture is not about the what or the who, but about the how. How can the architect act as an essential advocate to the community at large? How can design identify the essential needs? How can architecture provide the essential resources 
public resources. We must never forget that all of architecture is public. As residents of a city, any city, we know that despite never occupying the majority of the surrounding urban fabric, it still has a profound influence on our lives. And as such, that influence can be positive or negative. There is no neutral. You create something, it will have an impact. That impact is not neutral. So how do you ensure that that impact is positive? So <laughs> easily said, right? But uh, what does that mean in practice? It means that you cannot find the right answers if you don't first ask the right questions. To act as a public advocate and create a public resource, you need to reframe the typical questions. Instead of who is the client, we should really be asking, you know, who am I designing for? Who should benefit from this project? Of course, we have an obligation to meet the client's needs, but we should not assume that these needs are in direct opposition to benefiting the community at large. So instead of what is the program, the better question is, and it requires us to think beyond the listed uses and think about the project uh, performing for the client, the community, the city, you know, at all levels. Uh, where is the impact? This is, or sorry, where is the site? This assumes a finite boundary, a limited space. You know, you're working within property lines as if the project is somehow an independent object within the, the larger uh, community. But instead, where is the impact? Let's think about size and scale as the desired impact, which speaks to the aspirations of a place. So beyond the designated space, architecture has the ability to positively impact those beyond the immediate site and direct users. You know, so how do we respond? So only when we ask the right questions do we have a chance at identifying the right answers. I'm gonna go through a handful of projects, not so much about presenting them on, uh, you know, about every design and detail and materiality and concept, but more so about how we reframed the questions to achieve what we thought were the correct answers for that project. So this first is downtown Brooklyn Cultural District. The site, if you're familiar with it, is in the heart of Brooklyn. Um, it's a mixed use residential building designed. We did this for a developer, Two Trees. It's a public private partnership so in addition to about 300 residential units and retail, we needed to uh, plan for 50,000 square feet of cultural space. Uh, it was on a triangular site bound on all sides by heavily trafficked streets. Beneath and adjacent to the site are seven subway lines and a Con Ed vault. And so, you know, while we needed to fit all of the program I just listed, what the site really needed was a place to pause. That, that was what this neighborhood in Brooklyn and really what Brooklyn as a whole needed. So given how much program was needed and the below ground restrictions, one would have assumed that the best approach was simply to fill the footprint of the site and then just extrude up. So, and, and you see this all the time. You know, these are the towers that are going up all around us. They build to the property lines and then they take the same building and they just, um, bring it up 20, 30, 40, 50 stories. You know, zoning typically requires that we step the building to maintain light and air. Um, this is obviously important for a more livable city. You know, we don't want to live in the shadows of everyone else's buildings. But just because you're providing light and air through zoning regulations does not necessarily guarantee a dynamic streetscape and it doesn't necessarily build community. So while one would assume the triangular site negatively limited the tower's footprint, you know, we basically chose to limit it more. So what we did was by shifting the tower's mass, and if you can see in the plan, you know, all the way to the east, um, making the tower basically as programmatically and structurally slender as possible, it gave the site and the city what it really needed, which was this public space. And then we sheared the volume in half to maximize the views, the natural light and break down the scale of the tower even more. The two slender volumes were then further reduced by perforated planes. We articulated the facades as kind of simple planes and then exposed the ends of the tower as glass. And this offered unobstructed views up and down Flatbush Avenue. 
And then with the tower's mass as slender as possible, we sought to draw the public to the cultural tenants. You know, so the cultural tenants um, and is very typical when um, private developers are designing with uh, having to provide community spaces or cultural spaces. In a residential tower, what are the least valuable floors? Well, they're not the first floor because that's for retail and they're not the top floor because that's you know, where the penthouse and the views and all of that are. They're the second, third and fourth floors. And the, the problem there is that you know, typically when a not-for-profit or a cultural entity is resigned to the second, third and fourth floors, they have no accessibility, they have no visibility. And unfortunately, they all too often fail because they don't have that direct connection to the public. So what we did was we basically took the, the public realm, took the street, folded it up and connected it directly to the second, third and fourth floors. And then we continued to break down the tower to, dis to make it disappear by cutting uh, slits into it and breaking down the overall mass. It was partly to in uh, deference to a, a historic tower that was directly behind us. Um, then we actually faceted both of the facades and we clad them in a reflective metallic so such that they picked up the light and the colors of the surrounding city. So the result was a design that prioritized the street where we experienced the city. You know, much is said about our skyline, but let's be honest, the skyline is for postcards. The skyline is for tourists to recognize who we are. Our lives are defined by the streets and that's where we need to keep our focus. Um, and then we went one step further, which was after we did the elevated plaza connecting the upper floors, we organized the cultural tenants as a spiral stacking one on top of the other in such a way that each one built off and supported the other, that the each was visible to the other and interconnected, ultimately creating a um, kind of ecosystem of, of culture, arts and culture. And this was the rendering that we presented to city planning. So you get the idea of effectively the public um, realm kind of continuing up and folding and connecting to all of these different cultural entities. You see uh, one Hansen, which was the original historic building. Uh, this is a very different aerial than what you would see now. This was what we showed city planning many years ago before there were residential towers. Right now, this entire area is completely eclipsed with uh, tall towers. But, you know, for all good intentions, we need to remember the client and the client's goals. If our solution was not financially viable for this developer, good intentions would not be enough to get it realized. Elevating the public terrace and connecting it to the cultural entities um, was also good for the developer. It allowed them to have 360 degree retail. Uh, you know, when we defined this, we didn't know what would go in it. You know, an Apple store uh, took that place, but that added huge value to the project. And that value added allowed us to leverage that towards the larger public vision. So it's just, it's so important to realize that by providing resources to those that don't have them does not necessarily have to have a negative impact on those that do. I think it's always about design should always be about um, creating mutually beneficial spaces. Uh, this is a view of the plaza, the stepped up plaza with the large glazing to the left being in the cultural lobby. Uh, these are some of the performing art spaces that are kind of expressing themselves as volumes. Again, you know, you don't hide cultural spaces in a residential tower, making them anonymous. You have to give them expression, give them visibility, let them have an active dialogue with the streetscape and hope that uh, it, it fosters patronage. And so the residential tower has been constructed and occupied uh, for a couple years now. And what's amazing is we had designed that entire building with the cultural tenants in mind, you know, we constructed the tower, trying to make it look more relevant to a cultural entity than a residential tower. And obviously the entire uh, folding up of the streetscape and connecting uh, that plaza was 
for the for the cultural tenants. But what's interesting is we did that entire project without ever having a conversation with the cultural tenants directly. Um, our client was the developer. And so once that was over, the New York Economic Development Corporation put out an RFP, which is basically a request for proposals from architects to see who they would select to work with the, com the tenants. Those tenants uh, are the Brooklyn Public Library, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, Mocada and 651 Arts. And I'm pleased to say that we were selected to work with them. Um, so despite the fact that we felt that we had created a wonderful gesture that would support the cultural entities and give them visibility and accessibility and connectivity, the reality was if we had approached the next phase, the interior, um, layout of the different cultural entities and given each one of them a storefront, it would have turned into an urban mall. You know, we needed to avoid each tenant having their own storefront, having their separate entrance. And why? Because as a city, as a community, we're always stronger together. And we had to, we had to continue that, that effort. So effectively what we did was the floor plans were conceived as open cultural landscapes such that when moviegoers went to the Brooklyn Academy of Music to see a movie, they would pass by the cinema, they would pass by the exhibitions. Those attending dance performances would become aware of the library's lectures. You know, we were creating our own foot traffic like you would expect uh, on the street. So the idea being that, you know, the four tenants ranged from very established institutions to new institutions that had never had their own home. Um, you know, huge patronage to kind of fledgling uh, performing art spaces. So the idea was that each one would increase the exposure and connectivity. And the wonderful thing that happened actually, when we started the project, one of the requirements that I asked of all the entities was that we meet together regularly so that we weren't just necessarily designing four different spaces. And the wonderful thing that came from that was that each one heard the other's missions, the other's goals, aspirations. And ultimately all of the different programs morphed together such that the um, Brooklyn Public Library changed from being solely a branch library to a production studio. You know, something that would be more culturally relevant to the performing arts spaces. And so each one morphed to support and somehow be tangential and um, reflective of the other users. So this is an image of the entry cafe, a gift shop and galleries uh, upon entry. What was very important was convincing the four entities that there should be a shared space in the beginning. Again, that people could come and kind of gather and it wasn't really about any one person designating that territory. The Brooklyn Public Library, you know, the wonderful thing I'll just flip back for a second. So this folded wall that becomes kind of a place of pause, it envelops the uh, gallery gift shop, but then it kind of undulates within the gallery itself to create different folds of uh, video exhibitions and multiple galleries. On the other side of the same folding wall becomes the wood wall that holds the display, the books, and actually creates a production studio. So the idea being, you know, with all of us with our phones, uh, we're all authors in some way. You know, libraries are no longer about curating just certain authors uh, with the printed word. You know, we all create content, we're co-creators. And I think this whole uh, project is about co-creation. Another view of the library. And the Mokata's galleries. Six Fifty One's gallery and rehearsal rooms, and the performance spaces. Here are some images uh, of our collaboration with the local fabricators, contractor, and client. Uh, while this project, uh, like many, was put on pause the last six months, it, it was actually these images that we looked back to during that pause, nostalgic for the <laughs> for the in-person dialogue and collaboration. Um, but I'm happy to announce the project was recently restarted 
and we are working towards completion in 2022 um, and more appreciative than ever of the collaborative process. And while these photos were all taken obviously before the pause, they represent the most valuable part of this project. You know, it's the heart of this project and what was not listed in the program, what was not asked for. And even in this unprecedented moment uh, of upheaval <laughs> on many levels, uh, it has still served a purpose. So while we have two years to go before the project is realized, a project more than a decade and a half in the making, architecture is not instant gratification, uh, we feel that we asked the right questions and in doing so, found the right answers. So in taking what could have been another private residential development acting as a standalone building, uh, we transformed it into a vibrant dynamic ecosystem with both public and private resources benefiting all in the surrounding neighborhood and city at large. Uh, the next project it was done in collaboration with the New York Restoration Project. Um, if you're not familiar that uh, Bette Mittler created the New York Restoration Project in the 90s to help clean up the community gardens all throughout New York. Um, in doing so, she realized the city could not maintain those community gardens. I believe there were 52 in total. And so she raised the money to buy them and her not-for-profit foundation then maintains them and um, uh, for the, the 52 gardens and communities. So we were asked to look at a site uh, in the Bronx, Willis Avenue Community Garden. It's one of the 52 wonderful community gardens that they, they own and maintain. So uh, they had a beloved casita um, but that beloved casita was desperately need a replacement. The casita is effectively just a small structure that becomes kind of a, a mini house to all the different activities that go on. Um, at the first meeting, the New York Restoration Project, uh, you know, it asked us if we would consider doing this project as a low bono project. And if we would design the casita, uh, give vision to the structure. Um, and, you know, given their limited financial resources, I under, I totally understood the reason behind that. They would go to kind of each person and, and ask for, uh, to, to help. Um, it didn't take us but a second to say yes, but I also know that, um, you know, they have this wonderful community of staff, operators, builders, and volunteers. Um, and it is this resource, you know, which is really their greatest resource that needed to be taken into consideration. So we offered another solution. So instead of giving them the what, you know, a one-off design, it, we felt it was much more valuable to pro provide them with the how. We would work with them to create a modular design, kind of a kit of parts, so that they could continue to engage, plan, and build as they needed um, on their own terms and with their community. So what we did is we identified the universal characteristics of a module. Um, identifying, you know, how it could be adaptable, promote community, offer flexibility in the future. Um, what protection from the elements was required, but not to provide something too, too enclosed or contained, you know, such that it maintained visibility and was safe. Uh, create a human scale, you know, one that was responsive and contemplative for one, dynamic for several and welcoming to all. And the size of the components each considered carefully as to what one person, two, four, a group of 12 people working together could achieve. So again, this notion of scale, right? You know, typically we think of scale as just the finished product and occupiable. Now we were thinking of scale as it related to how someone could physically assemble something either alone or in groups. So each component, you know, had to have a scale. And also then the scale of how that single module could offer endless possibilities. So then we also created a step-by-step -step manual, kind of taking, taking some cues from Ikea, uh, which only required, you know, what was important is that it said to be something that it could use now and till the end of time. So what we used were only those materials and tools that were available from any hardware store. 
and to illustrate what was needed. And with New York Restoration Project and their volunteers, we assembled our first casita together. Having that direct involvement, uh, we learned with our own hands what worked and we learned what didn't. <laughs> but together we resolved the issues and constructed the first casita. But more importantly than us constructing the casita with them was what the community brought to its full realization. You know, this was not about us trying to create their identity. This was about creating a piece of infrastructure that they could use and, and really bring to life. So, you know, how we approached this project and ultimately what we created for the community transformed this project from a single structure to endless possibilities. Make the Road Community Center is the next project. Uh, Make the Road is a nonprofit institution that builds the power of immigrant and working class opportunities um, and communities to achieve dignity and justice. They're an incredible group. They um, acquired a site along the elevated seven train in Queens. Um, how they make change. They do so by protesting in the public realm, making injustice visible, gathering support in the public realm. They are the ones that have led the fight against the current administration to protect immigrants' rights and to keep the US, you know, what wonderfully it is, which is a wonderful melting pot of opportunity. They offer legal, health, educational resources to those who need it. Um, you do not have to be an immigrant. They will open their doors to anyone that they can support, but their, their mission has been focused mostly on immigrant, working class family, LGBTQ communities. And while the site may appear challenged, I mean, being adjacent to the elevated train does have its um, issues. You know, there is vibration, there is noise for the, vi for the passing train. It also has wonderful opportunities there. You know, if you've ever been under the elevated train, it acts as this wonderful, almost like communal porch. Uh, you know, it, it carries the energy, the vibrance, the noise, the smells of the wonderful um, restaurants and activities. And the adjacent Corona Plaza, uh, where many of their protests and many of the festivals that happen in Queens occur there, it gave a wonderful ability for this community center to connect and to draw that energy. So what we were looking to do was to say, again, we have to acknowledge that there are challenges with the elevated train, but more importantly, what does this offer and how can we ask the right questions to take what might want to be a community center that supports marginalized communities, sometimes at risk communities and take it away from wanting to be a hidden bunker and celebrating that which they do and the change that they make. So Make the Roads location really meant that if you've been along the, uh, the seven train, there are not many high buildings there. So if we were to be able to rise above the elevated train, it meant that we had incredible visibility visibility from the bypassing trains, both to the east and to the west, visibility because basically we're one of the few buildings along that skyline. We also studied their program and decided that the energy of the surrounding neighborhood should extend into the community space. And so their program of learning, building community and offering support could be clearly defined in the architecture to reinforce and encourage that engagement and that accessibility and that visibility. So the auditorium, which is the yellow, takes the energy from the neighborhood, pulls it up into the space, really defining this wonderful public town hall, which will 
support their protests and their lectures and their uh, celebrations every single night. The learning spaces should were tucked are going to be tucked behind the auditorium um, on the ground floor, therefore accessible to all. Many of their classes uh, range from the youngest of children to all ages and um, ESL. And so the idea that someone could come in right at grade and kind of walk into those classes, making them set accessible. And then the staff, you know, the support, the ones that kind of protect, you know, symbolically and, and literally being kind of the roof, kind of housing and protecting everything inside. So this is the conceptual section. So we did have to provide a wall that kind of offers some protection to the sounds of the train, but where we could kind of create this, you know, fluid continuous landscape into the space. And then just to run through kind of as a reiteration. So it was all really about extending the public realm, making the resources visible utilizing those resources of uh, kind of creating the access. Um, again, kind of elevating the learning space, you know, taking the auditorium, tucking in the classrooms below. So, you know, learning becomes the foundation. I think, you know, education is the foundation for all of us. It's the thing that elevates all of us. And so how do you celebrate that as a community? Um, to make the road staff kind of uniting with that support. Um, it was very important that the site was so deep and so wide that we actually had to punctuate the workspaces with these skylights bringing light down. Um, for many of the members, access to natural light and to landscaping was not something they had either in their homes or in their workplaces. So it was very important to be equitable with the distribution of light within this space. And while we did want to protect this community, it was important that you can protect but not separate. And then you can also kind of create a facade, create an expression that is both about the celebration of the community and the individual. And we are currently in construction. Here's the auditorium uh, and hope to have this open by end of next year. This is actually the classrooms. So we have a sunken courtyard in the back, again, so that you're never far away from natural light or green from any of the spaces. And kind of the beacon that's created below the elevated train. So what, could it, what was a needed shelter was translated into a celebrated beacon. The next project is uh, NASA. Um, it's our research support building at NASA's Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. The previous projects focused on, I would say, a more equitable distribution of resources by providing access and visibility within the urban fabric, um, more so, you know, accesses to the true public at large. But, you know, we can't let any project parameter, any budget, any site constraint uh, ever dissuade us from figuring out how do we maximize resources, how do we preserve resources, and how do we really uh, assist and um, elevate the community at large. So, you know, we asked ourselves, how do we address the needs of a larger community? How can we think about a larger scale impact if the project itself isn't in the public realm? Um, in fact, it goes beyond that. If the project is located within a private, uh, highly secure um, campus. So, uh, you know, it goes back to all communities have resources. And as an architect, as a designer, our role, or, or maybe more pointedly, our responsibility is to use the design process to maximize those existing resources and connect them to new resources. Uh, I love this quote. <laughs> this is a great quote because it points out the inherent flaw in assuming the tools we each have at our disposal. An architect's tool is not building. An architect's tool is the design process uh, that ensures that what is built is essential. 
So seven years ago, we won the commission to design a new office building for NASA, which according to NASA's master plan was the first of two phases. We had a second potential commission um, for an administration building. So the, the pink shown was the office building that we were hired to design. And then the yellow was to be the second phase, a separate administration building. But what was immediately apparent was the lack of common space on the campus, um, especially outdoor space. You know, this is what the site wanted to be. Um, so we continued our study to figure out how we could achieve that, recognizing that what was asked of us was one or two buildings. So despite the site and program being clearly identified, we sought to analyze the entire campus to understand all the resources. And what we realized was there were so many underutilized spaces throughout the research campus. And to be honest, an administrative building is something, you know, administration is better located alongside the research space support. So we convinced NASA that instead of building a separate administration building, they were better off relocating all of these programs and, and putting them within existing buildings that could then function better. So while we would have designed both projects to meet and perhaps exceed sustainability goals, you know, because these projects actually had very high sustainability goals, we were going to try to do, um, if not lead gold or platinum, perhaps even a net zero project. But you know, we have to remember no level of sustainability, no amount of energy efficiency or recycled materials is a positive impact to our environment if the building wasn't needed to begin with. So as architects, you know, we have to, you know, we have a responsibility to the community at large and sometimes acting on that responsibility is deciding not to build, uh, which I recognize perhaps is not directly <laughs> related to uh, uh, driving up positive business. But I think that as architects, we have that responsibility and we have to be ready to make those decisions if that's the right decision. So after we convinced them not to build the second building, we focused on the building we were actually hired to do. And the original plan was that it would be a three-story building. Um, you know, quite common is to have the common spaces on the ground floor, open offices and training on the second, and then more uh, private meeting offices and private offices on the third, you know, with a central core. You know, it all seemed very straightforward, very efficient. But we asked ourselves, what did the site really need? Well, what the site really needed was um, to have all of those program be adjacent to one another such that you were maximizing the serendipitous exchange and that, you know, if we're talking about your greatest resource and you have the human capital that, that is NASA and the minds of NASA, the more engagement you can have between those different research groups, between the different engineers, the greater the outcome. So we took the meeting, the offices, the collaborative spaces, the training, and we elongated those you know, in this, in this sequence of rooms and then we started to shift them such that they started to connect to the adjacent buildings. So there'd be obvious uh, circulations connecting the campus as a whole. Then we took the collaborative spaces, those common spaces that would support the entire uh, campus. We rotated those and we reinserted them such that again, what we were doing is, you know, maybe it's because we're a New York firm, we like city grids, <laughs> but we created this new axis uh, on the campus such that anyone using any of the programs internal to the building or anyone coming to visit the building for the collaborative would engage. And that fostered a very straightforward, uh, efficient floor plan by which you see here the um, uh, open, if you look to the top, you see the open offices, the training rooms, the larger auditoriums, the private offices, everything. It's all about maximizing exposure. Anyone coming here immediately sees what resources are at their disposal. And ultimately their greatest resource are the other people within the NASA campus. So how do you, how do you maximize that? And the second floor, very similar. The only difference is that the large communal bar that uh, um, hovers above 
is the dining hall and a gallery and executive dining hall. And the beautiful thing about that is uh, to the top of the image, it actually reflects back to the airport. You know, most of NASA's research campuses are adjacent to the airport because there's an obvious synergy with um, uh, aeronautics. And then the, ele the elevated dining bar facing down reflects back to their research campus. Um, but even more important than the building organization was the idea that it defined this new outdoor space. So sometimes the greatest thing you can build is the stuff that you don't build. So this was really a, kind of a visible X in the ground, um, you know, symbolic somewhat of what you could see from space, but probably more appropriately what you can see from landing at the nearby airport. But that X in the ground not only redefined kind of the paths of the campus, but uh, created this outdoor space that then can support the entire community. And then to, you know, identity. Uh, this is uh, a exploded diagram of the building itself. Um, very similar to when you see the Mars Rover and other rocket diagrams by NASA. Oftentimes when you're working with your clients, it's about speaking their language. You know, everything you do in design is really all about uh, communication. So NASA uh, was a wonderful, had a wonderful culture and has a wonderful culture of functionalism. You know, they don't design the Apple phone. They use duct tape and mylar and send things out into space. And if it functions, it doesn't matter what it looks like. And so what we chose to do was let the building be a full expression of the components and that nothing was hidden. And so, uh, you know, we use the structure, we use the photovoltaic panels, we use the louvers that screen the, the heat gain of the wall and all of that became the natural exposure because what we loved is that NASA can take the ordinary and uh, transform it into the extraordinary. We are trying to capture some of that spirit. And so this is the view of the project. This is the elevated dining bar um, where you get kind of a 270 degree view of the research campus and of these geodesic domes and de-icing tunnels and gravity drops. Uh, these were the uh, community, communal spaces that were inserted, bringing natural light and air and green within the workspaces. This is actually a wall uh, that faces the airport. So this kind of barcode slots becomes this thickened wall that kind of buffers the sound from the airport, brings in natural light and actually houses all of the research that gets stored into this wall. And so we are, had it not been for the two government shutdowns, the project would have already been built, but we are very close to finishing up. We should be done uh, early next year. So again, asking the questions, looking at the campus as a whole, we were able to transform what could have been just a simple office building into really a common ground supporting this wonderful research, research campus. So while all of our projects differ in location, scale and program, and the resources available within each communities varies greatly, all communities have one thing in common. Every community's greatest resource is their human resource, their human capital. So as designers, we must always seek to optimize that most valuable resource, the users, the surrounding community and the world at large. Uh, architecture should not be thought of in terms of what, but of how. How can it be a tool? A tool to allow communities to dream, plan, and create for themselves, or act as a beacon to give a community visibility, presence, making their resources more accessible to the city at large, or provide a platform to elevate individuals of a community, connecting them to their collective accomplishments, present actions, and a glimpse of a shared future or even perform as a landscape to provide the community with a common ground. So thank you. <laughs>